Good afternoon. Um, we're privileged to be with uh, three fantastic writers, Jung Chang, uh, the author of Mao, The Unknown Story, with John Halliday, her husband, and most recently, The Dowager Empress, a um, magnificent biography, actually, of Empress Shisi, which completely overturned my impressions of her and um, makes her out to be the first modernizer of China. Uh, Vikram Chandra is that rare person who can write computer code and write novels, um, very good novels, um, one of the nicest collections of short stories I've ever read, Love and Longing in Bombay, Sacred Games, um, and most recently, um, an, a work of nonfiction, Geek Sublime, which talks about this uh, strange uh, dual love affair in his life, which we'll talk about later. Uh, Simon Seabag Montefiore is the author of Young Stalin and um, uh, The Court of the Red Tsar, um, as well as a um, biography of Catherine the Great and Potemkin. Um, so the writer's life, um, the subtext was the trials and tribulations of the writer's life. And I have to say, looking at these very glamorous, rather relaxed um, looking people, um, I'm not immediately reminded of Rudolfo and Mimi in La Boheme starving um, in a garret. Uh, how, how stressful is the writer's life? Well, who's, who's going to answer that? <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I mean, I mean, um, we may all look relaxed and happy and, and cheerful because we're in Boulder and we love being in Boulder. But I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that is an enormous illusion. This is a facade. Um, we, are, we are anxious, uh, we are f afraid, our stomachs are groaning and churning, um, we live in constant fear of the, the next review, the, the, the next deadline, um, the next research we have to write, the, we're searching for ideas, we barely sleep, um, we can barely eat. Um, the writer's life is, ladies and gentlemen, it, it's hell, it's, 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 it's purgatory. Yeah, I, uh, my colleague, the poet, Robert Haas put it very nicely. He said, writing is hell, but not writing is also hell. The only tolerable state is just having written. <laughs> well, I, I think I'm going to um, uh, be different, <laughs> different, because I think writing for me is something that gives me happiness. Um, the thing is, I may have come from a you know, different background. I always wanted to be a writer when I was a child. But when I was growing up in China, China was under the tyranny of Mao. And it was impossible even to dream of being a writer. And all, you know, nearly all writers were persecuted, sent to the gulag, driven to suicide um, in those days, in the 1950s and 60s. And even writing for oneself was dangerous. So I wrote my first poem when I was 16. And when I was lying in bed trying to polish my poem, um, I heard the door banging. Uh, the Red Guards had come to raid our flat. And I had to quickly rush to the toilet to tear up the poem and flush it down the toilet. And that ended my first literary venture. <laughs> but the desire to write never left me. And in the following years, I was exiled to the edge of the Himalayas and worked as a peasant and as a barefoot doctor. And then I worked as a steel worker and an electrician. And when I was spreading manure in the paddy fields, when I was checking electricity supplies on top of the electricity poles, I was always writing in my head with an invisible pen. So when at last I became a writer, I always think of those days when I couldn't write. And, I, I, and so I feel that's something that gave me happiness. Did you actually keep a journal after that first experience? Um, I kept some poems, um, but then when you know the po political atmosphere got more intense and I burned some, but I kept some. When I was researching wild swans, I, my first book, Wild Swans, um, was written as a result of my mother's 
I mean, it's a long story. I don't want to take up too much time, but I mean, <laughs> if you spare me a few minutes. And now, then Mao died in 1976, and China began to change. And in 1978, for the first time, scholarships for going abroad were awarded on academic basis. I sat for a national exam, I did reasonably well, so I became one of the first group of Chinese to leave China and study in the West. And when I got my doctorate in linguistics in 1982, I was the first person from China ever to get a doctorate from a British university. And then, I, for 10 years, I didn't want to write because I was having a riveting time um, you know, in Britain. I won't take up too much time. I, I'll come back to that later if we have time. But then I didn't write for 10 years. And then in 1988, my mother came to stay with me. And for the first time, she told me the stories of her life and stories of my grandmother. And once my mother started, she couldn't stop. She stayed with me for six months and she talked every day. And the, <laughs> and, uh, by the time she left London, she had left me 60 hours of tape recordings. And when I was listening to my mother, I thought, I've got to write all this down. And then I also realized how much I wanted to be a writer and how much I had always wanted to be a writer. And so after my mother left, I um, transcribed the tapes and I did more research and I wrote my first book, Wild Swans, the stories of um, my grandmother, my mother, and myself, and 20th century China. And, um, and so, have I answered your question more than that? And this, and this is really for Vikram and Simon, who, uh, Simon was, believe it or not, has, uh, did something even stranger than computer programming before he was a writer. He was an investment banker. Um, with Credit Suisse First Boston. Uh, and Vikram um, did computer programming to support himself through his first novel. So you're both people who've actually done other things, worked at other professions. And I wonder what, what it was about writing that, that pulled, you, pulled you into writing books. I, I should say um, that my trajectory has been the exact opposite of Jung's because while Jung was born into... Uh, the crucible of tyranny in, um, in Maoist China at the height and in, in, in experienced the height of the Cultural Revolution, the horrors of it. I grew up um, in London in, um, in you know, happy middle class life, or I mean, looking back, it was happy. And I, as I grew up, I found my life far too boring. I wanted to be a writer, but I wanted to experience terrible and extraordinary things. So while, while Jung was, 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 was keen to flee, to flee this or to write her poetry in secret, I was, I was, I was planning my escape from my world for, for the completely the opposite reason. And, this, and I did become, I went, the first thing I did was to become a gold miner in South Africa, down a gold mine in the Orange Free State. And the next thing I did was, um, then, I, well, then, I, then, I, then after university, I became an investment banker, where, in, which, in which case I would long to write my novel. And I worked for the chairman of the bank um, as his assistant. So I started to write my novel, and I had, which was full of kind of, it was a university novel full of sex and, um, and intrigue and university politics. And I was in, because I was the chairman's assistant, I was in charge of this kind of secretariat of, who all worked in secret, working on huge billion dollar deals. And so I said to them one day, I said, I want you to type this up. And they started looking, they looked at it, they said, what is it? I said, I said, let's just call it Operation Citadel. And, and let me just tell you something about it. It is top secret. So they started looking at it and they said, what is it? Who's writing about this stuff? I said, the chairman has asked me to do it. The chairman has asked me to ask you. It is top secret. If anyone says a word about this, um, someone will be fired instantly. So they all started to write this novel up. And every day they would bring it me in an envelope that said, in a special closed thing that said, top secret, Operation Citadel. And so gradually they wrote this novel, um, which I did in the end um, to publish. And no one ever realized that, um, that, the, that the chairman's office had done this. But as soon as I got the chance, I left investment banking. And I, when the Soviet Union started to break up, I immediately set off 
I ran a bed, I, I then lived in New York and I ran a bed and breakfast company in Maryland. And I said, I want to go and stay in, in the Soviet Union. And they said, where do you want to stay? And I said, I want to stay. They said, do you want to stay in Moscow and Leningrad? I said, no, I want to stay in Tbilisi, Yerevan, Grozny, Samarkand and all these places. And I, cause I, I felt my chance had come to, to experience life the sort of things I wanted to do to become a writer. And so I set off for these places, and every single place, this was in 1991, and every single place I arrived, civil war broke out within hours of me arriving. <laughs> and, and I remember um, my, the guy who was in charge of my tour thing, he, I said to him, like, he said, what do you want to do? I said, well, civil war's just broken out today. He said, well, we might, do you want to leave? I said, no, no, take me to the president now. And the president was called Zviad Gamsikurdia. Do you remember him, Jung? And he was an insane character. He was actually a Shakespearean scholar who had become president of Georgia and, was, and had been damaged mentally by being a KGB um, agent as well as being a nationalist agitator, as well as being a Shakespearean professor. And he, um, no sooner had he won the election than a revolution broke out against him. Uh, and so I went, so my man, led me up the, 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 up the steps of the presidential palace to the sandbags where these young men were sort of smoking cigarettes with these huge howitzers and they were sort of defending the palace and he explained in Georgian what was happening and then they came around the sandbags and they grabbed this man and just threw him down the steps and he rolled all the way down the steps and I looked back and then they said you come with me and they took me in and I met the president and I spent a week sitting with him under siege discussing King Lear mainly and um <laughs> Finally, the war, civil war suddenly got nasty. And so I said to him, listen, Mr. President, any chance I can use your phone? Because he had a huge kind of phone. It was, this was the, when phones were very primitive. You know, he had the only satellite phone in Tbilisi was on his desk. And he, he, um, he, was, he would use it to shout orders to his, to his henchmen. I said, when you're making a speech from the roof, is there any chance I could ring my mother? Because she doesn't know I'm here. And she'll know that there's a civil war going on in Georgia. And he said, of course you can. So he went, to the, he went to the balcony and he started shouting from the balcony. People started letting off guns and he was shouting, you know, I mean, in a kind of frenzy because he knew he was about to be overthrown. And I rang my mother and I said, Mom, it's Simon. And she said, like, where the hell are you? I said, I'm in Georgia. She said, you can't be, there's a civil war going on there. I said, I, I know, I'm right there. I'm in the presidential palace. <laughs> then she said, then being a typical Jewish mother, she said, What's that noise in the background? And, and I, said, I said, well, it, it, she said, sounds like Hitler giving a speech. <laughs> like this. I said, well, sort of same difference. And, um, and that was how I, I started, I, I, how I became a war correspondent and started to write about the wars afterwards and how I began to get the experiences that in my childhood I'd lacked and which Jung had, had, had um, turned into a brilliant book with her, with her wild swans. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, I grew up with surrounded by writing. My mother is a writer. She writes fiction, but mostly screenplays um, in Bombay. Um, so I started telling stories to myself at a very early age in this completely nerdy, thick spectacle kind of way. And then um, Rahul and I went to the same boarding school um, in uh, Rajasthan, kind of near Jaipur. And it was a very, very macho boarding school. I mean, you what, got was he, what was he like? Uh, he, was a year, he was a year senior to me, or junior. I can't remember, but we did not really know each other. Not that. Vikram is perhaps the only published novelist from that school. <laughs> school right. full, of, full of jobs <laughs> and really stupid people. Right. <laughs> They're my friends. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the way that I managed to become friends and maintain friendships is that I soon discovered that in this, you've got to imagine like a British public school crossed with like a kind of Rajput madness. Rajputs are the warriors. Uh, and so I discovered that my talent for telling stories after lights out when the dorm was dark was actually some way that I could survive this place. And I started then writing stories and I got my first story published in the Mayur in the school magazine. It was science fiction, very Isaac Asimov. Um, and that was really like taking a hit of a drug, right? I mean, being published is great. <laughs> Uh, and, but because my mother was a writer, I knew that it was not possible to survive as a writer on a writer's income. Uh, 
And I once told my grandfather, I think when I was 13, he asked me, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I really want to be a writer. He said, that's all right, beta, but what else will you do? <laughs> um, and so I ended up then finally thinking that I would end up in film um, and went to film school and discovered the subject of my first novel um, in the Columbia University Library when I was at film school and then went off to write my first book. And by this time, I'd never had much formal training in computers, but um, I discovered that I had a hobbyist obsession with computers and people were amazingly enough willing to pay me for this stuff uh, and pay me really well, uh, which was very exciting. So I worked my way through um, grad school and my first novel writing computer code mostly. Um, and I mean, I, in the sense of like, I think the writing is hell question. I think the urge to writing is something that I've experienced from very early, but it's the sort of strange doldrums of being in the writing process that is the terrible thing, right? It's a grind and it's a grind in which you don't exactly know where you're going, especially if you're writing fiction, you don't know what the next day will bring. And sometimes you get stuck. Well, my wife, Melanie, is also a novelist, and we finally managed to get our two girls, who are now five and seven, out of the house. So she started working on a second novel. And she'd been researching this for years, and a month into it, she walks up to me and said, Vikram, what would happen if I just didn't do it? <laughs> and, because, and, and I think that's the sort of what Bob Haas said about writing is hell. It's the process of it day to day that can be quite exhausting and nerve-wracking and anxiety-producing and so forth and so forth. Is the intervals between the books something that you worry about? Do you, do you feel that uh, kind of trap till you're working on the next book? Well, I'm, I think in my case, um, as soon as I finished The Wild Swans, um, I, um, I felt Mao was my next subject because I grew up under him. Um, I saw him turning the lives of a quarter of the world's population upside down, and yet I felt the world knew astonishingly little about him. And I myself had many questions when I was writing Wild Swans. I'm, so um, then I decided to write a biography. And my husband, John Halliday, who helped me with Wild Swans, um, was also interested in Mao. So we embarked on this project together. And we divided our research by language. And because I'm Chinese, so I dealt with the Chinese language sources. And John, unfortunately, speaks many languages, so he was landed with the rest of the world. <laughs> And, and in, in particular, he knows Russian, and he spent a lot of time rush, working in the Russian archives. He's a friend of uh, CBAX, so I mean, they, um, I mean, and, and um, which turned out to be an absolute treasure trove. Um, we also together we interviewed nearly everybody who had interesting dealings with Mao in this country. You know, Henry Kissinger, George Bush, the senior, all the heads of the CIA, um, and so on. And we had a tremendous fun. I mean, this 12 years, we spent 12 years writing the biography of Mao, and those were the most riveting 12 years. And for example, we, we interviewed this man called Monbuto Sese Seko. I don't know whether you remember him. I mean, the tyrant of Zaire, who's now dead. And, um, and we very much wanted to interview him because China was doing a lot of things in Africa, not just now, and back in Mao's days, it was trying to get into Africa. So he had a special relationship with Mao, Mobutu. And we, one day, John and I were in the Hong Kong hotel, having done our research in China. And John was in the bathroom reading his morning paper, local paper. He suddenly yelled, guess who's in this hotel? Um, I said, who? And he said, uh, it's Mombuto. And he said, shall we try to find somebody to uh, introduce us? And I said, oh, John, you know, I've done two month interviews. I'm exhausted. I'm going to the hair salon. <laughs> so, so I went to the hotel hair salon. And uh, a quarter of an hour later, who but Mombuto strutted in? <laughs> and he... Uh, 
he's, uh, he sat under this hair thing. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, in the um, hair salon, he had bits of cotton wools around his neck and bits of towels around his uh, a bit of neck and the shoulders. And he was trapped. So I was able... <laughs> I was able to, 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 to go and um, uh, to, when I was there to have my hair rinsed, I, was, I paused in front of him and asked him for an interview. And that's how we got an interview with Mombuto, which was a riveting um, interview. And then, if I may just tell one story, which was the interview of Imelda Marcos. You know this Filipino first, former first lady who had thousands of pairs of shoes. Um, in the shoe store. It was uh, in, her, in her flat, which indeed was dotted yeah, with little shoes. And she said she was promoting Filipino shoe industry. <laughs> but anyway, she had this um, flirtatious relationship with Mao because Mao was a womanizer. And, and when he met Imelda Marcos, Mao was nearly blind. But still his eyes sparkled when he saw this gloriously dressed, you know, former beauty queen. And so he, his hands were shaking. He picked up Imelda Marcos's hand and put it to his lips and kissed it. And um, this gesture of a man kissing a woman's hand was condemned in the Cultural Revolution as a bourgeois gesture. And anyone who indulged in it would be subjected to denunciation meetings. And so Mao's photographer was so scared, he didn't dare to take a photograph. Um, but luckily for us, the newsreel camera was rolling and recorded this moment, and so we have a unique photo of a rapt Mao flirting with Imelda. And Imelda was trying to flirt with my husband, John, and he was furiously bashing eyelids at John. And then, and then she turned up to me and said, you know, Western men simply don't understand us Eastern women. And so John said, and have you found any Western men who understand you? She said, only one person, Richard Nixon. <laughs> I, I have to say, you're both doing, uh, you're all doing a terrible job of suggesting that writing is very, very stressful. <laughs> this is one of the most entertaining afternoons I've had in a while. <laughs> Um, but on a stressful note, you both, um, Simon and, and Jung, um, lived with the monster. You know, you've written about Stalin and Mao, respectively. Um, what was that like, uh, coming, coming home after doing all that archival research on the Great Leap Forward, the horrors of the Cultural Revolution, the purges? Of um. Well, I mean, I mean it, it, it is a very strange thing to live I'm sure Jung will agree with me. Um, it's a haunting thing to live with these people. And um, I think, I don't know how many years you've spent on Mao, but... 12. 12 years. 12. I mean, I've spent, also spent about the same on Stalin, because I wrote two Stalin books, Stalin the Call of the Red Tsar and Young Stalin. And I must admit, it does seep into your life. Um, you have dreams about the things you discover. I'm sure Jung has, because she's actually experienced, experienced the society as well. But the only way you can write these books, and this is true, I think, of all writing, um, whether it's, whether it's I, I, write, I write, also write novels and, and, I, I, and I write history books as well. And whatever you write, you have to write with total obsession and total immerse. You have to immerse yourself absolutely in it. I think, I think anybody can be a writer, um, I, but I think you have to want to be one from the beginning. I think all three of us, that's probably what unites us. But you have, to be an, you have to be an obsessive. You have to be almost as obsessional, I mean, as, as the people you're writing about. I mean, someone like a Ch a Mao or Stalin, these are people who were obsessed with politics and power from a young age. And of course, that, always, that, that also goes with the fact that they were always obsessed with themselves and their own role in history. And that's virtually all they thought about. It's all they cared about. Um, they were often very sorry for themselves. Um, Stalin was a very morose character. But all he thought about was himself and his own role. One of the things I discovered was that he always watched John Wayne movies in, in his old age. 
And people will seem terribly surprised by that, especially in America. But it didn't surprise me at all because he saw himself, and I think Mao may have been the same. Stalin, I think, saw himself as a, as, as a sort of lone warrior uh, with no name, a name he'd invented, riding alone into a, into a sort of lawless town, lost, not unsure which way to go, ruled by bad people. Um, and he, ro- he, ro- he, he, he was the sort of cowboy with no name that rode into town with a shotgun and just restored order and restored, and then just rode out of town, betrayed by everybody, but having restored order and achieved greatness, and still alone facing history. And that's how these people see themselves. But I agree with you, and the fascinating thing about it is to... Is to it's yeah. also fascinating. It's yeah. not just, you know, our books, I think, are not just um, a compilation of evils and horrors that these monsters have committed. And we are also there to understand him. And through our eye, we hope our readers we have to. also we understand have to. him. And also there are riveting things which I would never dream of. You know, Mao, for example, he ruled China for 27 years and he never took a bath. Or a shower, and he never brushed his teeth. I mean, you know, this all his breath this, was famously bad, breath, wasn't it? And his teeth looked. If you look at these photographs, uh, later photographs, they were black and from uh, tea and so on. Anyway, you know, things like that. Uh, it was quite a, also it makes you feel amazing, uh, and. Um, so right. it was actually riveting um, to, I mean, every day I think John and I, um, we meet at lunchtime and we reported each other's discoveries and we have small and big discoveries and we were riveted throughout. Yeah, same here, yeah. Yes. And I must say one thing is like, for example, you'd find just extraordinary things. One day you'd find documents about Stalin had actually written on, a, you know, he'd, he'd actually kept a sort of, some, a, a sort of arithmetic. He was, he was, calculating in tens of thousands people in jails and who would be shot. He, di- he divided people who to be, were to be shot into people to be arrested immediately, people to be de- arrested and to be deported, and people to be deported, to be arrested and shot instantly. And these, these the fascinating things, these things he wrote out and dictated himself, and what, they were in quotas. So they were by, they were by tens of thousands, but at the same time, I also found a file with his daughter, Svetlana, who was actually, who who aged about seven, was pretending to be the dictator of Russia herself. And she would write notes that said, to the Politburo, Joseph Stalin, Beria, Molotov, and so on, I hereby order that all homework be abolished in the Soviet (laughs) Union for the next year. And, you know, Stalin and Molotov and all of them would sign it, would sign this document and stick it on the wall in their kitchen of their, fa- of their flat. So, again, as Jung says, yeah. very mixed, very mixed um, things. But we had terrible nightmares. And even my wife had nightmares about Yezhov, the, the poison dwarf of Stalin. One day she said to me, and she hadn't, I hadn't even told her about it, but she, think, she thinks she's psychic. So maybe she just imagined it. But anyway, that's another story. Um, Over to you. Well, I mean, in terms of self-narrative, my last novel was a big novel about gangsters, organized crime, and policing in India. And one of the interesting facts that I found out was that there's a very famous gangster named Dawood Ibrahim, who now lives in Karachi under the protection of the Pakistani intelligence services, and he watches the Godfather series obsessively. Right? So this attempt to narrativize yourself and understand yourself, I think, is, is common among great leaders of men. Um, I think as a fiction writer, you engage in this similar kind of process, but perhaps in a more personal kind of way, because my monster in my book, in that book, is a man named Ganesh Gaitonde, who becomes the, one of the godfathers of Bombay. He's a rapist, he's a, uh, he's a killer, he executes people. Um, And so what you're trying to do is, you know, you do your research, you go out and meet people, gangsters, policemen, and so forth, but then you have to imagine, uh, and especially since I was writing Ganesh Gaitonde from a first-person point of view, you have to sort of method act your way into his consciousness and actually try and see the world from the point of view of somebody who does that. And it's a very attractive position also to be in, right? A critic writes a bad review, you send somebody out to break his knees, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> I was just going to come to that, actually. And then, you know, the cops are, are, some of them are now friends of mine, but they live in this entirely brutal world um, where you're very practical. If you're trying to get to gangster A, you put pressure on people, B, person B and person C, and you maybe break apart their family, maybe you send them to jail, maybe you beat them up in order to get that guy. And that's just part of the daily life that they lead. So at the end of my eight years of thinking about this stuff, and after the novel came out, was when I first became aware that I'd really messed up my head. Right? <laughs> that this was not a good place to be, to be thinking in terms of this sort of excessive violence and executive actions. Um, and it was only in the aftermath that I noticed that, that I'd, I'd sort of gone native, as it were, into this world. And some parts of me have still remained there. I mean, I, I do think I have this now this cop's vision of life in that I'm looking out at all of you and I'm thinking, I don't know what you've done yet, but you've, you've done something wrong. <laughs> I just need to find out what it is. <laughs> um, speaking of people to eliminate, um, can we... Can, I, I did want to ask a question about reviewers and bad reviews. What's the worst review you've each of you has received? Oh, my first review ever <laughs> was, was, so I'm 35, my first novel is releasing in Bombay. My mother has finally started to believe that I'm not going to go come to a bad end. Uh, at Crossword in, in, in South Bombay, they're going to do an opening and then somebody calls on the phone and we knew that there was going to be a review in the Hindu um, that weekend and somebody said, if you go to Churchgate, I think they just got their shipment of the Hindu. So my mother makes us drive all the way to this train station, read the review, I'm sitting in the front reading it, and I swear it's one of the worst reviews that any writer has ever gotten. I mean, things like, you know, it's a watery waste of a novel and stuff like that. And I still have it. I, I walk around with it. Because it makes me understand that if you can survive that review, then all the others don't really matter. Was you, sorry. Well, I was very lucky with Wild Swans. I, I got, um, you know, a um, vast majority of the reviews are wonderful. And so I got completely spoiled. And then when my Mao biography came out, and we got wonderful reviews, um, I think Seabag also gave us a wonderful review. <laughs> and, uh, but we also got, uh, particularly from a lot of, um, let's say, American academics, um, some uh, very, I think to me, very unfair and um, very pro Mao, Mao apologist reviews. Um, well, I think, you know, I'm mature enough to take that in my stride. I think Mao, um, in Mao, we, discovered, we realized, we calculated that Mao was responsible for the death of well over 70 million Chinese in peacetime during his 27-year rule. And yet he had so many admirers in the West, and particularly in the um, academic world, and actually particularly in America and in India <laughs> for some reason. Um, and. Um, and people are still trying to and say, you know, we are biased and I was out for revenge. Um, I think that's a common accusation. I was out for revenge as though, you know, having grown up in China, because my father died in the Cultural Revolution. My beloved grandmother who brought us up also died in the Cultural Revolution. And their deaths were the most, most painful part in my Heart. I mean, earlier we were talking about the agonies of writing. I think while we're writing Wild Swans was a, a process of um, intense agony, but, you know, more than writing about Mao. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, so, um, so we, that, <laughs> the bad reviews. And so I was, at first, I was outraged, but then I feel, you know, the. The world is unfair. I mean, now I think basically we have, I, I feel quite proud in this that John and I, and we, and we have written a book which has um, to a large extent changed, helped change um, the world's view of Mao. Um, and the man who really belongs to the League of Hitler and Stalin. And uh, and so I, and as you know, ten years passed since the publication of our Mao biography, and um, nobody has pointed out any factual errors 
in our book, and they could speculate about me revenge or you know whatever. But still, I mean, you know, our facts and our analysis have stood the test of time. So I, as time you know <laughs> goes by, I I don't care about those. In fact, all this somebody collected these bad reviews and published the book, which was called "Is Mao Really a Monster?" <laughs> That is the remarkable thing about some of the reviews. They seem to be quibbling about whether he was really as bad as you make him out to be. But I, I mean, and some of the reviews are quite astounding because of that strange leap of logic that you're being taken to task for calling a monster a monster. Um, I mean, he, you know, he was a monster. I mean, he nobody questioned, nobody could prove, nobody could even state that our figure, that 70 million people have died uh, because of Mao's rule. Nobody has proved that, finger, that figure wrong. Um, I think that figure speaks for itself. Okay. Yeah, um, we're running out of time. So questions from the audience? I was very grateful to know that the Berlin Wall came down. And I just wondered if anyone has any insights what helped bring the Berlin Wall down? <laughs> Politically, what, JFK, I mean, for example, JFK went to Berlin and said, Ich bin ein Berliner. And that was very exciting. Uh, it seemed like a spark during the 60s. And then the Berlin Wall came down in the 90s. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think Ronald Reagan said, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, bring down this wall. And I think, um, we, let's give him credit for it. And the people of Germany, the people of Berlin who went and, went and pulled it down. Thank you. Okay, opposite of hell, what do you enjoy most about writing? I mean, the thing I, the thing I most enjoy about it is just the storytelling. I mean, I love writing, trying to immerse oneself into trying to understand other people and then telling a story. I mean, I, we were just thinking about the reviews, the question about the reviews. We, of course, it, um, I've, of course, I've had bad reviews, like, but I've been also been very lucky with my Stalin books and my Catherine the Great books. But of course, one's much more vulnerable in fiction, in fact, um, with reviews. And, um, and so the reward is even greater if you get good right. reviews, isn't it? But I think the great joy is to tell stories and to write about private life, to write. I mean, the, the reason why I love writing my novels is it's about, I mean, the history books are about power and what makes that, motivates that. But the, but the novels are about private life, about love, about, about adultery, about marriage. And I think private life is the most fascinating thing to write about and the most most fulfilling. Right, and I mean, for me, the editing then starts to become really pleasurable um, in the sense that you start to see the shape of the book, right? And sometimes, I'm not exaggerating, it happens on the 21st revision, right? That you finally start to understand what the architecture is. And then there's these beautiful moments where you see an image and you realize that without you knowing it, you've put that image in variations on that four times before this. So there's some part of your consciousness that's been working on it and you find these symmetries that just sort of fall into place and then you really believe. Uh, the, the Sanskrit word for poet is kavi, uh, which literally means seer, as in somebody who sees, right, in a mystical sense, um, through the normal sort of uh, haze of everyday life. And in those moments of like, that's when your writer's ego swells and you think, oh, I'm so good. I just did this and I didn't even know I was doing this and it's perfect. Uh, and those are the afternoons that you just like remember when that happens and you take it with you for the, <laughs> the next 40 days of the trek through the desert. Well, if I may say, for me, I think as a foreigner, um, um, English is not my first language. I mean, to, to work with this language and to try to make it right is immensely um, satisfying. You know, I, um, when I was growing up, schools were closed um, in the Cultural Revolution. And you, when universities began to reopen in 1973, I went to university and studied English when I was 20 when I was 
20, <laughs> so how, how old was I? When I was 22, um, and, um, and in those days, you know, the, our text China was completely closed, and there was there were never a foreign there was never a foreigner, and our teachers had never spoken to foreigners themselves. So our textbooks were direct translations of Chinese texts. I remember the lesson greetings because in those days in China, when we bumped into each other, we said 吃饭了吗？上哪去？ which means, where are you going, and have you eaten? So those were the English greetings I learned. And I remember when I first went to London, I used to go around and ask people where they were going, and whether they had eaten. <laughs> and so, coming from that, to write in English is immensely challenging and uh, satisfying right. for me. And I should say the joy of language, right? You spend two days working on a sentence, and there's something slightly off about it, and you can't quite tell what. And then you remove one comma, and you slide in one more word in the second clause, and suddenly it just sings. And that's extraordinary that, to I feel th that. Yeah, I, 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 think that yeah. I think there's polishing the language and rewriting. Yeah. When, when it's written, I think the most mm -hmm. exciting thing, because all writing is about rewriting. And I think the most exciting thing is when you, kind of, when you have it already written, and you can just start working on it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I tell you another great thing. I think. For literature in many ways, the internet and Facebook and Google and all Twitter are a disaster, let's be honest. But in other ways, but in other ways um, it's a wonderful thing because for the first time, um, we can all get, I mean, I get contacted by people, um, normally nice people, normally people with an interesting thing to say, who's, you know, who can tell, and I'm sure both the other writers agree, who, who tell you that you've, they've you've touched your life and your story in some way, and, it, and, and it's, it's very rewarding. On the other hand, you also get kind of weird things, like uh, for some reason on Twitter recently, um, my book, Young Stalin, has a picture of Stalin on the front with a sort of beard and a hipster hairstyle. And so n recently, the weirdest thing has happened in America, and I blame you, because <laughs> I've begun to be sort of assailed by millions of Twitters from girls of age between 16 and 21 and young gay men, all of them saying that they have fallen in love with young Stalin's picture on the front of my book and literally saying stuff like, um, you know, I want to I wanna do young Stalin. And I told my mother that and she said, how could you? That's gross. Until I showed her the photo of hipster Stalin and then she said, wow, I want to do him too. So, you do begin the book with a pretty gripping bank robbery, which is somewhere between Bonnie and Clyde and the Sting. Anyway, um, the Jaipur Lit Fest uh, may be based in India, but they're very strict about finishing on time, which is quite unusual. <laughs> quite <laughs> so, unfortunately, I have to wrap things up. Thank you all. Really wonderful panel.